Hey everyone, welcome to the final Earth Science Review video in the series. This is going to be Unit 9, Geologic History. So this is going to actually be three topics combined into one topic called Geologic History. We're going to do radioactive decay, relative dating, and then we're going to look at pages in the reference table. So you're going to need your reference table today. All right. So here we go, we're going to do the, the content first, and then we're going to do some practice questions to finish it off. Okay, so we're going to start with radioactive decay. So this chart is actually on the top left-hand corner of page 1 on the reference table, and there's four radioactive isotopes, carbon-14, potassium-40, uranium-238, and rubidium-87. The disintegration means what the product, I mean the, the carbon-14, here it is right here, turns into over time. So here's K40, which is potassium-40, turns into those two things over time. Uranium turns into these. Rubidium turns into that. I'm going really basic on this chart. So there is a whole topic about half-lives and what they mean and everything like that. We're just going to focus on how do we solve the problems today. So this here, the half-life number, that's how many years it takes to cut half of carbon-14 into nitrogen-14. So essentially, if you start out with 100%, it takes 5,700 years to end up with 50% of carbon-14, and so on and so forth. So every time you want to do another half-life, you have to add whatever the amount of years is. Same with potassium-40, uranium, and rubidium. So here's what they're used to, to do. So anything that was once alive recently, you use carbon-14. Any minerals, we would want to use potassium-40. Uranium-238 and rubidium-87 are things that are really, really old that you want to figure out how old they are. So there's this little uh, trick called the fat chart that I'm just going to run through how to use real quick. So it's P-H-A-T, and it stands for an acronym. So we have the percentage, the half-life, the amount, and the time. So here's an example radioactive decay question. I'll show you how to use the chart. So it says analysis of a basalt rock sample shows that 25% of its radioactive K40 remained undecayed. How old is the basalt? So if you look on the chart, K40 is potassium 40. That has a half-life of 1.3 times 10 to the 9th years. That's 1.3 billion. So we'll set up a fat chart. So what you would do here is you would be starting out with 100%, which is zero half-lives. We don't have an amount in this question. But we're just going to make an asterisk here. Let's just say it's 100. Actually, we'll say it's 200 grams. Just pretend it's 200 grams so I can show you how the chart works. And then the time that goes by initially would be zero years. So what happens is we're going to go one half-life. So that would be 50% of the K40 would be left, which means that would be about 100 grams if it was 200 grams of the initial amount. And that takes 1.3 times 10 to the ninth years to do. All right, so then if we want to do another half-life, we're just going to have 25% left, which would be 50 grams, and that would take another 1.3 times 10 to the 9th, so that would be 2.6 times 10 to the 9th years. So there's our answer. So at 25%, the basalt would be 2.6 times 10 to the 9th years old. If they asked for 12.5%, we would have to do another half-life. So that would be 3, which would be 25 grams amount, which would be adding another 1.3. So this would be 3.9 times 10 to the 9th. So essentially, use the fat chart to figure out whatever you need to figure out. If they ask for how many half-lives is it to get to 2.6 times 10 to the 9th years, the answer would be 2, and so on and so forth. So this will answer everything. All right, the next little topic is called relative age, which means what happens first. So there's a couple of different things that you got to realize for um, relative age in terms of how to date the layers in terms of which came first, second, and third. So the first thing is all layers have to be deposited in flat layers, flat horizontal layers. So if they were folded, meaning they looked like this, or if they were tilted like on an angle, that had to happen after they were deposited. So that's the principle of horizontality. The second thing is this principle of superposition. The oldest rock layer is always on the bottom. This is assuming that nothing was flipped over or broken or anything like that. The next thing is if you see any contact metamorphism, which are these lines here, that had to have happened after the rock layers were already there or else it would have no 
rock to metamorphosize. So if you see this igneous intrusion here, that had to come after the rock layers were already deposited. Anything to do with a fault, uh, folds or cracks in the rock, all of that also happens after the rock was there because you can't break something that wasn't already there. And an unconformity is a, a, a layer that was used to be there, but then it was eroded away and a new layer was put on top. So essentially we know that there used to be a layer there, but it was eroded away. So here's just an example if you wanna pause the video and sort of uh, get an idea of what I'm talking about here. Here's the picture on the right and I ranked the order of what things happened in what order. So in this case, all of the layers of rock were deposited first. So the limestone and then the sandstone and then the shale. So here's there, there, then another limestone and then a sandstone. And then after that, then they all got faulted, which is that bold line that goes diagonal right here. And then after that, this igneous intrusion came in and created contact metamorphism as it moved through. And the reason that you know the fault had to happen before the intrusion is because the intrusion here is not cut by the fault. It's not split, which means the splitting of the layers that fault happened before the intrusion. All right, last but not least is this geologic time scale. So this is on your reference table and it's sort of like a two page uh, booklet. So you have to open up your reference table to be able to see both pages. So I'm gonna start from the left and move to the right and give you a little rundown of this chart. So on the left side, you'll see this is the actual time scale of the Earth from 4.6 billion to zero. Okay, so this is all of time. Now if I open this up a little bit, we split all of time into the Precambrian and Phanerozoic eon. So we're just breaking the time of the Earth up into smaller pieces. We then broke that into late, middle, and early parts of those two eons. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is the gray area here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things, and then eight, nine, ten, eleven. These twelve things that I have um, a dash next to all happened before this bold line here. So in order of oldest to youngest. After those things happened, so many things happened here in the Phanerozoic that we couldn't fit it all in this little area. So they squeezed it, they squeezed the rest of this chart, which is all the white area, into that little white area on the top. So all of this is actually in here, okay? So now that we know that, I'm going to get rid of all my dashes here. We're going to go just in the white area here. So in the Phanerozoic, this is going to be from 542 to now. The most recent stuff is on the top. So we split it into three eras, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, Paleozoic being the oldest. We then split those into time periods. So here's the end of the Paleozoic. So the start of the Paleozoic is down here, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, is the now the Mesozoic, and you go up and up and up and up into the most recent. The epochs over here are going to be from latest on the bottom to most recent on the top again, and you could see we also have numbers, how many millions of years ago they were. So for example, if they wanna know how long the Permian uh, period lasted, you would pretty much just have to do 251 million years ago, because that's the end of the Permian, and figure out how many years are in between when it started, which is 299. And you could do this between any time periods. So the Triassic, like for example, started at 251, ended at 200, so it's 51 million years long. The next section is things that were alive. So um, things that were alive during these time periods. So there's a lot of different things here. You could just read through them. But ma major ones to just look at are these mass extinction events. Mass extinction, mass extinction. There was another extinction here. And essentially the mass extinctions, there was another one here, are major events where a lot of creatures were just wiped out in some way. Go to the next section. This is how much of the rock record we have of that time period in New York State. 
So if the box takes up the whole box, that means we have the full rock record. For example, the neogene, we have none. Paleogene, we have none. This one, we have a partial rock record, so on and so forth. Okay, this section here, we're going to just look at the bars themselves. So these gray bars, like we'll just take the trilobite bar, for example, forget about the letters. The trilobite bar started here, which means they were essentially born in the Cambrian time period, and they survived until the end of the Permian. That's the trilobite bar. If we go to this bar, the nautiloids, right, they started in the Cambrian, and they're still actually alive today. And you could do this for each bar. So essentially, the shortest living organism on out of these bar are these guys, the placoderm fish, because they were uh, born in the Silurian and they went extinct at the end of the Devonian. So that's a very short amount of time that they were actually on Earth. Now, for the letters, the letters represent index fossils, which is a specific type of species of that type of animal. So for example, A, B, and C are all index fossils of trilobites, and those letters are located on the bottom. See, A, B, and C. So for example, if we take A, this thing, Elliptocephala, that A was only existing in the Cambrian, uh, middle of the Cambrian, and that's it. So the good thing about these index fossils is that if you find, if we were to found a piece of rock with the Elliptocephala in it, we would know that that rock is dated the middle of the Cambrian because that's the only piece of time that that thing existed. And last but not least, these are anything to do with geological events. So like building mountains, making oceans, uh, breaking Pangaea. So there's a lot of stuff there. I would just recommend reading every word on this chart so you just know where things ex that things exist. Like the Akkadian orogeny, like... There's a, if there's a question that asks about Akkadian orogeny, you, if you already had read that word, you would know that it's on this page. The answer's on this page. And over here, this is just tracking where North America, that's us, moves over the course of time. So we're moving to the Northwest. All right, so that's pretty much the rundown of that. So those index fossils on the bottom that we're talking about here, in order to be a good one, it has to have existed over a large area and only existed for a short period of time. So that gives us the best index fossil. So like if you look at this picture, if you want to pick which fossil is the best index fossil, you want one that's in each location, but only in one layer. So the best answer is going to be this guy. Because it's in each location, but only in one layer. For this one right here is in multiple layers, so it's not as good. And the other ones are not in all four locations. And the last but not least bit of content is that volcanic ash is also considered to be a good index fossil because it's a large volcanic eruption, so it took up a large area, and it was a very, very short amount of time that it happened in. All right, so now we're going to do some practice questions. So get your reference table ready and pause and then see if you could do it. All right, here we go. Timeline below represents the time on Earth from beginning of the Paleozoic era at A to present. Which position best re represents when humans first appeared? All right, well, if you look at this, it says humans are all the way up here, which is extremely recently. So your answer to this should have been 4, D. Number two, approximately 2.2 billion years ago, which gas was added to the Earth's atmosphere from life forms that evolved in the oceans? All right, so we got to go to our reference table and go to 2.2 billion years ago, which looks like here's 2 billion, so 2.2 is right here. And here's our gas right here. Oceanic oxygen begins to empty it, uh, enter the atmosphere. So C was our answer. All right, number three. Scientists infer that early North American humans hunted the mastodon. Carbon-14 dating of the rib bone indicates that 2.4 half-lives have passed since the mastodon was killed. How many years ago did the mastodon die? 
All right, so I'm going to set up my fat chart. So all I need is the half-lives and the time. So zero half-lives, zero time. One half-life takes 5,700 years for carbon-14. Two half-life would take 11,400 years. We're just adding 5,700 each time. Three half-lives would take 17,100 years. And it asks for how many years would be 2.4. So we want 2.4 would be in between 2 and 3, right? So the answer is in between these two numbers. So it looks like the answer is going to be C. Number four, which life form existed on Earth for the shortest period of time? All right, hopefully you were paying attention when we gave this answer before. Here's your life forms up here. So placoderm fish has the shortest bar. So D is going to be the best answer. Number five, which group of organisms, some which of were preserved as fossils in early Paleozoic rocks are still in existence today. So which of these four is still in existence today? All right, looks like if you check all of them, the only one that's not extinct is going to be the brachiopod. A. All right, so now we got some rock correlation. Based on the evidence shown, which rock layer is older than the fault? All right, well, we know that black shale, brown sandstone, gray siltstone, and red sandstone must have been there before the fault because they're all affected by it. They're all broken. So one of those is probably the answer. Uh, black shale, B. All right, which layer is the youngest out of all of the layers? Only look at the four choices. Don't go crazy with the picture. Just check the four choices. All right, let's find these. So brown siltstone is C. Brown siltstone, here's another one. Okay, A is gray limestone. Let's see that. So here's an A. Any other gray limestone? No. First of all, it's definitely not... A, because that's all the way on the bottom. So this is just gone. We want the one most to the top, the youngest. Red conglomerate, that's going to be B. So let's look at that. B, I don't see it anywhere else. But now it's younger than brown siltstone because it's on top of the siltstone in this outcrop. So B is currently the winner. If we can get rid of that. So brown sandstone is the only one we have to check. Brown sandstone is here, D. And it's also here, which is way underneath C. And C is underneath B. So red conglomerate is the youngest. All right, number eight. Volcanic ash is a good time marker because the ash... So remember, it's a good index fossil if it's a large area over a short time. So we want that, so eight. Number nine, when the rock layers in the three outcrops are correlated, which one would be the oldest? So first of all, it, they're not labeled, so we would have to look on the reference table to see which ones are which. So A is shale, so the shale would going to be this one. The siltstone is going to be this one, B. The conglomerate is going to be this one, and the limestone is going to be this one. Okay, so we want to know the one that's most on the bottom. So here's A and A right a and a here's c and c so c is definitely underneath d a and a is here which means this b layer is definitely underneath the a layer and here's c and c c and c being there means a is underneath c which means d is on top of c so our answer is going to be this one is the one that would be mostly on the bottom, B. Siltstone layer in outcrop two. Number 10, which process most probably produced the irregular shape boundary between the limestone and the shale? So here's the shale and here's the limestone. They wanna know what this thing is. So that is going to be an unconformity, which is an area that was eroded away and then buried on top of it. The shale was put on top of it after the, the layer was eroded. So D 
eroded it away, and that's an unconformity. Alright guys, well that concludes the Earth Science Review Series. I hope you found this helpful. Good luck on any tests, and good luck on the rest of the year. Talk to you guys soon. Later.